The Articulate Coven is the original, unofficial podcast and fan community for Anne Rice's Interview with the Vampire and Anne Rice's Immortal Universe from AMC and AMC+. Welcome to The Articulate Coven. We are your hosts. I'm Joel. I'm Ashley. And we are The Articulate Coven. This is our rewatch of season one interview with the vampire from AMC and AMC plus articulate coven is the unofficial fan cast and fan community for, uh, Anne Rice's vampire chronicles, the lives of the Mayfair witches and AMC and AMC, AMC plus's immortal universe, including both of those franchises. And who knows, maybe more in the future. Uh, Ashley, Season, we have done all of our homework. Now we've caught up with what we've missed in the off season and we are ready to begin uh, I feel like this is dessert. We're we're getting to rewatch and, and savor this wonderful series once more before we get new content in May. It's so dessert. I'm so excited. I've been like I started watching the episode and I was like, why? Why have I not rewatched this 800 times? Why am I denying myself this absolute visual pleasure and delight? And yet I have denied myself. So I'm really excited. I had such a great time rewatching this first episode, just kind of, and I watched it on the big screen in my living room with the, with the lighting turned up really, really loud so that I could, I could see all the lighting changes and it was just, oh, it was beautiful. I'm having a grand time. I'm so glad we're rewatching. Okay. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I didn't have this in my notes, but now that you say so, I want to talk about the way that I rewatched this too. Okay, so you and I, when we when when the when the this first season was airing uh, live, when it was dropping week to week, we would rewatch the episodes uh, at least a couple of times. Most of them we ended up watching like three times before we would right. discuss it. But that was only with the context of that episode or the episodes that had released before. What's going to be interesting about this is that each episode that we discuss. We're, we're going to have the context of the full season and even now a glimpse into what's coming in season two. Yes! So the hints and the little things that might be coming ahead, that that's something that we're going to notice. But I do want to mention specifically the screen that you watch this on. Okay, uh, personally, I watch a lot of content on my iPad. I, I edit uh, on my iPad for a living, and so I have a very nice one. I've got the big, fancy 12.9-inch iPad Pro, which has a great screen. And the new one that they're about to drop is supposed to be even better. I'm very excited about it. And so most things that I watch personally, I end up watching right there. I can put my earbuds in, and I've got great surround sound, and a very nice, bright screen. That's awesome. I will admit, and I got to thinking about it, when Interview first dropped on AMC, my wife and I had a screen, like an actual projection screen hanging yeah, in our bedroom. Yeah, that's right. You guys and were we doing were a projection. Using, yes, we were using a low rent project. It was a fairly cheap projector at the time. And and one of the things that I hated about that was on our initial watch, almost always, it was never bright enough for me because of the projector. Right. And I will say this time, and I think every episode I'm going to watch this way. Uh, first of all, I bought the whole season in through Apple's TV store. And so I own the episodes in, in, I believe they're in 4K. Maybe they're just HD. But either way, I downloaded the highest quality version available. So I knew I would, didn't have any like streaming compression issues. And I watched them on my MacBook connected to this wonderful new 4K 27-inch computer monitor that I got for Christmas this year for my kids. Ooh. And so let me tell you, things popped out to me in a way this time that they had not popped out to me before. And I think part of that is about my attention and focus, thinking about the season overall and what we already know happens. But more of that, I think genuinely was the screen. So when you watch season one, listener, if you thought to yourself, oh, this feels muddy or, oh, this feels dark, whatever, take our advice here. And in, in your rewatch, if you're not already doing it, try to do it on your brightest, nicest screen that you have access yeah. to. Yeah. Genuinely. Do turn it. the lights off in the room. Turn the screen brightness up and enjoy the HDR effects because genuinely the variation across the screen is really special here. You know, the, the prototypical example of that actually is like Godfather, um, the cinematographer for the Godfather movies. Uh, well, one and two, at least, you know, played on the edge of visible light at all. Uh, the shadows right. and some of those scenes are just so deep there. They're swallowing people whole. Um, and this show does a very similar thing. Well, and lighting is 
lighting is incredibly important. It's it's just as much of a character um, as as the costumes, you know. And we talked. I, I know we talked a lot about our first viewing of all of this. How what a beautiful character the city of New Orleans is, and to be able to see this beautiful city that we both love so much in the correct and perfect lighting is just mwah, chef's kiss. Yeah, there were things I noticed that I never caught in my first watching this time. I mean, obviously, you're always going to have that. But just visually, it was pretty wild because I did my initial watch on my TV for sure every time. But then anytime I rewatched, I was frequently doing that just on my on my Samsung, you know, like on my cell phone. So it was not always the best picture and not always the best medium to really enjoy this in. So let me give a little um, heads up for the way that we're going to do this rewatch. I I know that some of you didn't buy the season. I know that some of you don't subscribe to AMC year round. And so in case you don't have the ability to actually watch along with us on this rewatch, I thought we'd do a little bit more, um, I don't know, sort of templating of the episode up top. And then Ashley and I'll dive into our actual discussion. So first of all, we're going to be talking about episode one from season one, directed by Alan Taylor, written by Rollin Jones, Anne Rice and Ben Philippe are the other two credits on this episode. I think Anne Rice gets a credit for almost every episode of the season. She and Christopher, of course, are credited for the whole series and for all the series, I think, as executive producers, even though, as we discussed previously, Christopher and Anne, before she passed, both of them had walked away from this project. And Christopher in particular seems uh, disappointed and sad with the entire endeavor, but also silent. (laughs) So uh, I I wrote a little synopsis of what happens here. And I want to run through that again, in case you didn't get to rewatch it. Uh, We meet Daniel Malloy, well-known journalist and author, uh, watching his own commercial and worrying about his health when he's confronted by the past. Louis de Pointe de Lac, a vampire that Daniel had attempted to interview decades before, mails him a package of the tapes and an invitation to continue the interview. Daniel accepts, and in modern-day Dubai, we begin to hear the tale of Louis and Lestat, his maker and our favorite vampire. In the early 20th century, Louis is courted by Lestat following the untimely death of his brother, and finally, in desperation, he accepts the invitation, just as Daniel had for the interview, and Louis starts his new vampiric life in the titular throes of increasing wonder. The episode itself, uh, in increasing in throes of increasing wonder. Um, poetry direct from uh, Lady Anne herself, and that's another topic that we're going to talk about in full. But overall, uh, Ashley, what were your thoughts on this first rewatch? Oh, it's so beautiful. You know, like, just from the moment it starts, you are in it. I am sucked into it. I am in this time. I am in this city. I am in, especially once we get to Louis, to the interview, to Louis telling his story. It just, once we're in New Orleans, I am just in love. I am a smitten kitten. I I look for places I recognize in the city that, you know, it's just, I love every every bit of it. I really enjoyed our time with Louis's family more than I had before. I think that it's something, and all the performances were so great, and we talked about that before, but I think, I like, I was always ready to get to the next exciting vampire thing, you know? So, um, but this time I really just enjoyed those scenes with Louis's family so much more than I did the first viewing. Um all of the secondary characters were just so much more vibrant and really popped for me. Not just, I mean, visually we've talked about, but but like as characters, because I already, now I know them and I know what journey they go on. So obviously I'm not having to spend my time trying to remember who's who. I already know who's who. So having that cleared up really kind of helped me sort of sink my teeth into it even more. I was just blown away by how much money they spent on this thing. I mean, it, yeah. it just looks like yeah, a billion dollars, time. right? It looks it looks beautiful Ooh. and cinematic in a way that I genuinely never imagined that well, we'd get to see this story portrayed. Dubai seems like otherworldly. It's like it's like a like a 
like how you picture Mars in a thousand years to me almost, you know, it has this sort of, (laughs) you know, this like overwhelming kind of beauty and wealth. And it doesn't look like any sort of discernible place that you can recognize unless you're familiar with like the skyline. So it's just, to me, it has that, it it gives it such an, uh, an otherworldly edge, like immediately once we're like into that sort of going down that highway, going down that road that was so wild, such a just, ah, and that sort of really mirrors in the first film, the end of the first film where uh, Lestat's driving the car, driving that beautiful, beautiful Mustang down, down through the streets of San Francisco. It's just, I love, I just, I love it. I love it so much. I'm so glad we're rewatching. I am too. I am too. Uh, I mentioned earlier the the poetry from Anne, but there are all sorts of wonderful lines. The dialogue, and, and again, this is another mm. thing that I was really struck by. You know, you and I, I also had not watched this between when we ended our coverage of it and now this rewatch. I hadn't I hadn't gone back to it. I purchased it and then never actually watched it after that purchase. I, I think I posted in our Facebook group that it had gone on sale, but. Mayfair left such a bad taste in my mouth, very frankly. (laughs) And I, well, I mean, and I don't, I don't even want to harp on it, but it like, it really bummed me out in a way that it, it like um, tarnished my memory. I think of this season uh, a little bit, even I, I thought to myself, well, that show seems so great because you just love those characters so much and you don't love the Mayfair witches quite as much. And, but that's not true. I mean, it is true that I don't love any of the Mayfair witches as much as I love Lestat, but I love these worlds equally. And even in the books, right. they they're already the same world. And I think my ire at Mayfair is informed because they are connected. And I, if you're in our Facebook group, we've got a discord, we've got a Facebook group. If you prefer either one of those, join the conversation. The fans are always talking there, but I have, I've, I've found myself being, a little down on the prospects of the Talamasca series that we talked about previously. And I, I realize it's specifically because I, I feel like, like I've almost got, almost got like PTSD as a fan for <laughs> what they did with the Mayfairs. And I'm just like, well, can they ever get it as right as they did with this again? Now revisiting this and walking through this, this rewatch, I think I'm going to give myself confidence again that at least Rollin and his corner of the universe will stay untainted and and glorious. But here's a line that I that started this whole conversation. The project that boyish youth presented us prevented us from finishing. The project that boyish youth prevented us from finishing. What a man, Louis, Louis in the novels is lots of things. We always talk about him being the saddest vampire, but he is also one of the most empathetic vampires and yeah, he is absolutely. he is also incredibly artful in his ability to communicate his feelings. He's cold and cutting when he wants to be, and he can harm Armand or Louis uh, or Lestat as much as anybody else can because they love him so much. But he can also put something in such a succinct and beautiful way. Anyway, I, I think that we, we downplay that sometimes and it's highlighted here for me. It jumped out right there from the beginning. Um, there's a line though, Louis says, what does it cost? And this is right after they first get together. Um, or excuse me. Uh, Daniel asks, what does it cost? And he's talking about the uh, penthouse and the privacy from the government and the right. access to the bridge and the hangar and all the things. What does it cost? And Louis answers quite a lot. But the look on his face this time and knowing the arc of the season, I thought to myself, Daniel's talking about what does it cost for the government to give you these things. I don't know that Louis is talking about the government. What is his deal with Armand? What is it right. that he pays? Well, and then part of it, too, is also just being a vampire. What's the cost of that? What does that cost you? You know, what is that? Mm, mm. What is what is living this life cost you? Um, Armand, um, his presence in the background now that we know that he's Armand is just searing to me. Like I, I can't stop looking at him. I can't stop looking for him. Like I am really excited to see 
you know, it's kind of we talked about this a little bit beforehand when we when we were speculating about uh, whether or not our, Rashid was Armand. And <laughs> one of the things we talked about was like, you know, are they is it going to be a, are we going to find a lie within this? Or is he being presented in a way that is not going to hold up once we find out that he's Armand? You know, is it is mm-hmm. it like the Fight Club lie or did they do it like, you know, uh, I see dead people? <laughs> So right. um so that's kind of like something I'm really watching with a mind for as well um as we're going forward is just really investigating that that all the presentations of him every time we see him I'm looking I'm trying to find out if they cheated like that's what I'm doing it's like my little my little game of bingo or something that I'm playing Okay so likewise I wonder to myself this time, is Daniel also cheating or playing a straight? Daniel says, or excuse me, Louis says to Daniel, and yet you got on a plane with an autoimmune disease in the middle of the pandemic. Daniel's sort of slow rolling it like he doesn't really care to be there at that point. And Louis's like, no, you want to be here. Why? And Daniel says that, oh, he doesn't remember everything. And, you know, he asks stupid questions and he wants to get it right. Is he playing it straight there? Or I wonder, does he already know that they've messed with his mind in some way? Does he already know? For instance, I don't think, I don't believe that he knows that Rashid is Armand. The surprise on his face at the end of the season tells me that that was new information for him. But does he know that Louis is the reason he doesn't remember the interview very well? Right. Right. And I think that that's a really, a really interesting a really interesting thought and something to pay attention to um, as well in this rewatch, just like what does he knows because he knows, even though he was on drugs, he knows that he wouldn't just forget all of that. Like it really doesn't matter. Like if you're an addict and I, you know, we have, uh, you just like, you know what your habits are as an addict. You know what I mean? And so I know he knows he wouldn't just forget all that. Even if he was on, like, the bender to end all benders. And that's kind of been what's presented is that he was on drugs and, you know, all that jazz. So it's very, that's something that's really interesting to me. I feel like he has to know there's a, something's wrong in the fact that he doesn't remember. I do as well. I, I got the sense this time that it's not, the, on my initial watch, I was like, oh, He's ill and he's old and he's wondering if he's going to have a second chance at immortality. And that's why he wants to go to Dubai. But this time I think, "Mm, I think he wants to know the story of his life in a way that he is certain at this point that he doesn't, you know? So uh, I I want to point out here though, we've talked about how beautiful this, this series is, but, but in these first three scenes, basically we get three different real looks. The look of, of Daniel's life in his uh, uh, apartment is basically monochromatic, right? Go back and look. It's all neutrals. It's whites and grays. It's very plain. It's very, it's bright, but it's simple and there's nothing to it. Dubai, on the other hand, is very dark, but also minimalist. It's, it's, you know, slates and uh, deep purples and uh, not a lot of lush fabric. Then we go to New Orleans. Yes. Yes. Very sleek and, and modern, right? Modern, but then we go to yeah, New Orleans yeah, yeah. And, and Louis' memories, and it is electric, and it is mm-hmm. technicolor, and it is lush, and it's wet, yes. and it's, you know, thick, and it's velvety, and it's all the things that you want New Orleans to be. It reminds me of the I moment in Wizard the of air. Oz. Yes. You know, right? like, I yes, can feel thick. the air, like, when you're standing by the river off to like you get off to cater you go past to cater and you go over by the river and you stand there like at the top of that levee and that way the air feels i could literally feel it you know what i mean like oh that's i know that we go on and on but new orleans is truly the best city in the world uh and then as soon as we get our first glimpse of New Orleans, we also get our first glimpse of, of Sam as Lestat. And just, God damn it, I love him in this role. <laughs> he's just he's just standing there too. on the street. He looks so, so good. His coat 
with the with the small cape and the hat and his hair. Mm. He's just he's just perfect. It's the most perfect casting. I I mean, really and truly, it is. Mwah, it is uh, that is a job seriously well done because this role. This role is, in my mind, was impossible to cast, you know? And the fact that they did so well, they knocked it out of the park. They really knocked Louie out of the park as well, I feel like. Um, and the two of them have such a incredible chemistry and rapport and curiosity with each other. It's just, it's so fun watching them. Like, as, a, as someone with an acting background, it's so fun watching them act together. You know, I can see them working together and know as an actor what it feels like to have a partner like that. And it's so fun and it's so exciting. And of course their chemistry just blows off the screen like that. But you know, it's not, it it occurred to me this time. It's not just the two of them though. The casting on this entire thing, top to bottom is just superb. So every, every player, I mean, right here in this, this first scene, you got Louie coming up in the car the, the guy that's bringing him the money that, that he's like, you know, you got any hidden in your fucking folds or whatever. Like that guy's right. great. The alderman is great. Bricks is amazing. Right. Everybody at that Tom poker game is fun. Everybody at that poker. They've all got interesting faces and they've got yeah. a, like a whole, you know, I did a, I did an interview with a friend of mine for an episode uh, for a podcast called intergalactic. We talked about, I shared a, a, a link to it in the uh, Facebook group. I think is this we talked predator? about predator from 1987. <laughs> yes. Ah, okay. Predator. So one, one of the things though that I said about predator and I, this, this, the, my rewatch of predator this most recent time really brought this to the forefront, but predator is like the perfect example of the admonition that we give to screenwriters to show don't tell, right? Predator mm. tells us, nothing about any of those characters. There's no backstory for any of those men. And yet they show us again and again and again, what those dudes are like. And by the time that they start getting knocked off, you care and are invested in every single one of them and their relationships. You know, yeah. Even if this you're glad, even does if that. part of it's you're glad that guy yeah. got it. You know, <laughs> that's a really great observation about Predator. Well, it's true here too, though, right? Like they don't tell us anything about Tom. They never tell us that Tom is fucking Louis. I mean, screw, you know, screwing him money wise. Right. They never tell right. us Absolutely. that Tom is fucking all these other people that he's at, there at the poker table with. But they show us that Tom Anderson is for Tom Anderson first, second, third, and fourth. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. You know who these men are. It's really fantastic. Um, that poker scene is just delectable. Like it is. I it 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 holds up so well upon multiple viewings there's so much to see within it oh i love that scene it's so great it's so fantastic you're right the whole thing is amazing yeah it is that from top to bottom that scene is chef's kiss i was heartbroken even more heartbroken by by louis brother this this viewing i was uh very very much much more heartbroken by him this time around because it just it felt he felt more vulnerable to me on this watch for some reason i felt more of his mental illness this time as opposed to like religious fanaticism i think because i had that in my head from from the book and 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 in the show i feel like it's definitely presented more as a mental a mental illness and so that that was a lot a lot more of a empathetic journey for me with him i wasn't like as annoyed and as put off as like oh uh, uh, his stupid brother you know normally that's kind of the way i felt and this time around i was just really really heartbroken by that whole by the by every bit of it them dancing together at her wedding um him him you know him having to deal with him getting him home off the street when he was acting a fool out in the street and all of that, all of that, him, him having imaginary conversations with someone. And then we also know in this world that it could be anyone that he's having a conversation with, because this is a world that we've created. We know that Lasher lives in. We know that we know that we have ghosts. We know that we have entities and things like that. So it's, it's just, I really, I was much more on board with that, piece of the storyline that I've really ever connected to before. 
You know, Ashley, I did not consider this when I was watching it, but listening to you talk it through right then, I just, I had a thought and I guarantee, I, I don't guarantee you, I imagine this is how Anne felt about it as well. Anne and I both were raised in a world and a culture and a tradition that was home to miracles. Right. Even though we were surrounded by modernity and reality, right? Uh, my mother's an educator. I know that fantastical things don't happen. And yet, I believe in a virgin birth and an immaculate conception and a resurrection and et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay. When you are of a faith tradition like that, you, anytime you're confronted with a person like Paul, you have to, first and foremost, you think this person is ill and we should get them help. But secondarily, you think, if a miracle happened to me, would I notice it? Would I recognize right. it? Absolutely. Or would I lie and hide it and, sh and shun it away? And I'm sure that's even, that's how his family probably feels. They all believe that he's unwell. They've put him in a hospital before. And yet, there's a hedging. <laughs> right, right. right. But what, Absolutely. But what if it's real? Well, so so that's is... the one thing on Paul. But. There's a, there's a line there, though, that I wanted to call out in that first scene, and this goes back to our discussion previously about the difference between this series and Mayfair. In my head, like a family of birds, many voices, but also one voice. That's how Paul describes it right there in the first scene, first time we meet him. That's mm -hmm. a line straight out of the book, or a, they take a, a line from the book and they adapt it into a dialogue. Anne had a way with words. Right. And the thing that this series gets right is that they use those words as often as is applicable. Sometimes they do not even apply them in the way that Anne had applied them, and yet they adapt and use the artistry. We have discussed again and again, and we'll talk more with this rewatch, about the changes that this series made to Anne's original story and how it ends up working most of the time. The changes in the story in an adaptation are not the problem for the Mayfair series. It's the lack of respect for the original artistry. Yeah. That's where they failed, and that's where Interview succeeded. Yeah, you really can't leave the poetry of it behind. Even if, even if you know, it's set in a modern, a more modern time, like Mayfair is definitely set, it would, it would seem, in our time period we're in right now, roughly. Um, it seems to be like, you know, modern time. It just... It, you, she writes so well. Why would you not have them say things that she's written? <laughs> it's just beyond me. It's so strange. It's such a, it's the pushing against the text that we've dealt with with the Mayfair series is just a real challenge for me as a as a fan and as a a watcher, <laughs> a viewer of it. But. I'm glad that that's something that they've done so well with this. I hope it's something that we can look forward to in the next season. I think despite, like you said, the Mayfair series kind of left it a, a bad taste in my mouth, a, almost like a fear of what might happen next with, um, with interview. But I think that based off of what we've seen from our, our, our previews and sneak peeks, we've gotten our, our wee trailers that we've gotten and just kind of, Doing this rewatch has really, really made me so confident in their storytelling again. Like, it just, I'm like, oh, yay, these people get it. They know what they're doing. This is fantastic. And I feel like I can kind of, I can, like, relax into the storytelling, and I don't have to be as stressed about if it's going to suck or not. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. I don't have to be stressed if it's going to suck or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, I don't think season two is going to suck. I think it's going to. I think it's going to very much not suck. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Dulac family. You mentioned them earlier. Mama oh. Dulac here at dinner makes this statement about uh, about Louis's business. She says it's a temporary situation. No, it's a breakfast. Excuse me. It's when when uh, Paul is making fun about uh, how the sister is going to get married down at the Mayfair house. Right. Uh, Jump a the temporary room. solution. Yeah, a temporary solution until Louis can find us a more respectable business. My question is, how long would Mother Dulac's patience have lasted without Lestat's arrival? Uh, would Louis have fallen apart after Paul without Lestat's pressure? Would Paul have fallen apart without the extra agitation? If Lestat right. never, if Lestat just goes to St. Louis and never comes to New Orleans, does this family self-destruct itself anyway? I don't. 
I don't know. I think that I feel like when you're in a situation where you're having to temporarily do something you don't love to or you don't aren't aren't like you know isn't your final journey, you know, to get to where you want to be. Sometimes you can be a lot more patient about doing that when you if you know deep down it's going to turn into something better. And I don't know I, I it's it's interesting because she definitely seems harder on Louis as the episode goes, for sure. You can tell she disapproves of his, obviously, his friendship with Lestat and how that is upsetting to Paul in that whole dinner sequence there and, and all of that awkwardness and strangeness that transpires at that dinner. And and I mean, I I... I don't know that they would have fallen apart as quickly. I don't know. I don't know that Paul, that Paul would have longed for the, for the, what, did, what is it Lestat says? His, for the cobblestone? Oh, is that what he says? God. I wrote that down later too. It's so He's, rough. Lestat is so cruel. Um, he yeah, the said, flagstone. Uh, his, I got to find head, that. His head yes, long for the flagstone. For the flagstone. <laughs> you know, and like, I just don't know that all that happens the way it does without, Lestat being there and being involved because I still don't know 100% that Lestat didn't have something to do with Paul. I don't know. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and, no, absolutely. Because we don't, we don't know. And we, and we're getting again, this is our, our Louis telling us our story here. So we don't know. We don't know what Lestat, Lestat's side of that would be if he was telling us. So I don't know. See, even, even what you just said though, Okay, Lestat has. I I did write a note. Lestat is so cutting when he wants to be in this episode, and it occurs to me: was he really though, or is that how Louis is remembering him, or is that how Armand has told Louis he was? For instance, at the end, he does the line about he says, "Your brother longed for that for that flagstone," but earlier when they first meet each other. He, uh, Lestat says, uh, he was explaining himself. He had laughed at Louis's name. Of course you are Louis. He said, I was floating past your, and he pauses and looks at Louis as he says, village. And I'm telling you, I saw it wash over his face, but I felt it in my own chest too. New Orleans is a lot of things, but never even in <laughs> Lestat de Leoncourt's life has it been a village. A village. Yeah. That's right? A, that's a very- I'm telling you. Go back and watch that scene. That pissed Louis off almost as much as him groping Miss Lily a few seconds later. And so now I'm thinking, did Lestat say that? Or is Louis remembering that? Or is Armand planting that? There's so many layers of unreliable narration here. It's like Inception. It's like douchebag Inception. (laughs) It's deuce, deuce bag inception. I love it. Oh my god, I love them all so much, though. It's so infuriating. You know, when you were talking about Louis earlier and how how he's the most we talk about, we joke about him being the Eeyore, but I mean, that's part of him. He had, and that's I I do think that's something that 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 um, Jacob Anderson does a really good job of bringing across is just how. And very quickly, how angst-ridden Louis becomes with what's happening around him, and 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 that he is so empathetic. He has a, a big heart. He loves dearly, you know. He really, truly does. And 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 it just seems like everyone he loves, he he ends up being hurt horribly, not necessarily by him, but because of what his actions bring about. And I think that. That's one of the reasons why he's able to stay a sympathetic, a sympathetic character and not a pathetic and not become a pathetic character that we're just like, ugh, sad sack Louis, you know, I mean, we say that, but we love him too. And there's a reason why Armand loves him. There's a reason why Lestat loves him. There's a reason why everyone has a little interest in what Louis is about because he remains and stays the most human of all of them. He absolutely does. That's a beautiful way to put it. Ashley, you mentioned earlier the poker scene and how great that is. But one of my favorite moments in that scene and what I wanted to ask you about is when Lestat is giving his 
you know, uh, internal monologue to uh, Louis. He says, I find it appalling how men like you are treated in this country. I wonder when we meet Nicholas in a later season. I'm guessing we probably actually won't meet Nicholas until season three. I think we're going to get some more hints at him in season two, but I think we'll actually see him for the first time in three. But when we meet Nicholas, I wonder if he's going to be hopped up for the French Revolution. We, We spoke previously about the the idea of whether or not they'd cast a person of color for Nicholas. And I think that is likely, but whether he's uh, uh, of African descent or not, I do think he's going to be in the spirit of the French revolution. The French revolution obviously was incredibly influenced by the American revolution. Yes. But more so by the Haitian revolution. You got to remember like Haiti was part of the French empire at the time. It was a French colony when they revolted. And that's really like what first exposed the French commoners to the idea of equal rights and, and equality and, and liberty from the bottom up, you know? So I, I think Lestat may have been genuine in that moment when he said, you know, I'm appalled by the way that men like you are treated in this country. That may have been genuine. We've said before, Lestat's not a good ally or anything. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> he's, a st- he's a stupid white guy still. But his heart oh, his heart might be in the right place, actually. Well, I, I, like, historically, that's a f- fucking brilliant way to incorporate that that kind of change. That's actually a brilliant idea joel they should hire you as the consultant or something <laughs> well i oh will say God. I, i'm sure most of you got this this link shared also but amc posted a thing recently uh are you interested in being a a pop culturalist or something like that i honestly yeah i saw that i signed up i don't know what it's going to be yet but i am one now so there you go i'm I, i'm excellent there. yeah you can put me on the payroll for season three rollin if you want to i am here for you yeah it's also well, my it's favorite like, book know- <laughs> shows right exactly shows have uh, uh, some shows long running shows have like a, a a show like they call it a, like a show bible or a show encyclopedia or whatever and that's like a a a, a, a document that basically has like the history of the show what's been established how to avoid really bad continuity errors like uh rachel having three different birth dates in friends you know like it's really good to have somebody on staff that knows their shit you know keeps up with the changes that have been made to the to the uh you know intellectual property to start with and 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 then keeps everybody on track i think you're you're the man for that job my friend well at disney it's working out just fine they got feloni over there that's been doing it for years for george oh. lucas for star wars and now he's you know graduating God, I love him. get his own movie soon so yeah, absolutely. And I can't wait. My phone number's oh, out there. You can I find me wait. online. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will say. <laughs> We're on the socials. The, listen, having having just read uh, or reread The Vampire Armand recently, I'm struck by how similar Lestat's origin is to Armand's. You know, they both loved beauty and learning, come from poverty. Lestat is an aristocrat, but his family is broke uh, when he's a young right. man. They... Their circumstances and their father's vulgarity, as as Lestat puts it here, tried to put out that flame, and yet how differently the two of them responded over the rest of the course of their life. We talked in the Vampire Armand novel episode about the fact that Armand is just fundamentally less curious than Lestat is as a as a human being, as an and as a person, right. you know. Um, but their origins here. I do find are very, very similar, actually. Well, it's interesting, too, like, in in, in this, like, uh, Lestat specifically, uh, as he, like, transitions, he's, his maker leaves him day of, goes into the fire, but it's like, by the way, I left you lots of money. <laughs> Good luck, <laughs> you know? And then, um, and then when Armand's taken in by Marius, he is now introduced to this world of, of, of luxury and beauty. And I wonder, though, too, like, He's not as curious, but he he does love like like the paintings and the art, you know. And Armand went went to go meet uh, 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 Caravaggio, you know. And like, I, it's so he is curious, but just in a different way. I don't think he's as curious about people. I think he's curious about beauty. Mm. That's fair. Maybe that's fair. Or like, yeah. Yeah, but you're totally right. They definitely come from different backgrounds into into this into this undead world, kind of similarly. And we talk a lot about Armand being very young. He is around 15 when he's turned, but Lestat's 
fairly young too. He's in his early twenties. Is that right? Yeah, in the book, I think he's like nineteen remember? or twenty. I, in this, yeah, show, like it's, it's going to be more like twenty five or twenty six. I think. Yeah, yeah. So we're. I mean, we we give we talk about everyone else being so young, but Lestat himself is quite young, you know. And so I think both of them kind of have an edge to them that's I think that's maybe why when we talked about in our Armand episode which I, I said he's as much of a brat as Lestat is if not more so but I think part of that is they are both so were so young when they were turned of course they're old 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 now and have lived centuries but you know there's something about that youth and not having experienced things that you know like the thing the loss the things that you experience uh throughout throughout a life up to you know we're in our 40s now so like think about us from the time we met to now like what the hell kind of wild ass <laughs> journeys have we been on and what have we experienced what kind of love loss hate anger you know satisfaction joy have we have we run through in those 20 years that our guys didn't get to have as humans oh boy that is <laughs> that is well said yeah i mean i yeah, I'm I'm 40, I'll be 43 this fall, and I think all the time about, I've absolutely led five or six different lives already. Oh, like, yeah. Like whole I've been like so many different people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and imagine yeah. extending that into this, you know, the centuries uh, through. But then how much of it really gets to, though? How much of it does? How much of you really does evolve and change in that way? Because you're living life now, not as a person, not as a human, but as this preternatural creature so it's not like you're continuing to live a human existence you have a different kind of loss when you separate from your vampire buddy that's going to be alive in 200 years when you decide to make up you know that's not the same life that humans live absolutely absolutely and that difference you can already see it here causing stress uh, between you know Louis and his family, even before he's turned in this episode, yeah. um, you, you can see the life that he's choosing is just a path that they can't follow. It's it's not for them, and and it is going to be a separation. That brings me though to the next point that I wanted to make. You know, we talk a lot about this being the sexy vampire series, and especially people who oh, don't know the yes. books that well, they were sort of shocked by the intimacy and the nudity in the first se- episode, and you know things like that, but. It's the greatest thing that Lestat and Louis share is not sex. It's not blood. It's intimacy, emotional Absolutely. intimacy. That's what scares Louis. Louis runs the first time that they sleep together. You know, Lestat sort of <laughs> not traps him. Lestat entices him with, <laughs> with Lily, uh, makes it OK. I love I love, by the way, the way that he lays the scene here. He. He's got Lily on the balcony. When Louis comes in, he says, the curtains are drawn. The help has been sent home. There's no one to see. You know, he gives him permission to be who he wants to be. And then he realizes, oh, Lily's in the way now. You won't be yourself even in front of Lily. Boom. I'll put her to sleep. Great. Now it's just you and me. And you can truly be yourself. And Louis is so terrified of that that he races the next morning to be just a great son again Lestat's in his rearview mirror that'll never happen again I won't even I won't even go see Miss Lily because here's the thing we realize later it's it's what weeks later at least several days he has not been to see Lily between that night and the night of his brother's death when he goes to her in desperation because he hasn't discovered that she's died already he doesn't he's yeah given he up. has no idea that she died he's given up even on his beard it's, he's living a celibate and life he, yeah and he craves understanding i feel like that's something about about louis that is just it's because he doesn't have it for himself that, that's the thing that i yeah, realized he today. doesn't he doesn't understand himself he doesn't have the language or the or the even the thoughts and emotions to describe his own sexuality and and the way that he views the world or wants to be in it. And it's only honestly through Lestat that he begins to see that. It reminds me, I mean, this is played for it in a trivial way, but you you know the Julia Roberts movie, Runaway Bride? You know, there's the scene where Richard Gere is calling her out on her favorite eggs, the favorite way to make eggs. And she likes 
the way, whatever way the man likes to make eggs. That's her favorite way, always, in whatever relationship. And he, when he points it out to her, she's like, oh, my God, I don't know how I like eggs. And it's sort of a silly right. moment. <laughs> but that's, you know, we talked about the trailer for season two where Claudia is asking who Louis, are who you? are you, Louis? I think that's what this entire series is about. Who is Louis outside of Lestat, outside of his mother and the expectations of his family? Out, okay, he, he seems to sort of struggle in some way with being a pimp and running this brothel and, and being, you know, the white man's boy, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. If he didn't have the responsibility of his mother and his sister and his brother to take care of his father's dead now, would he have, would he have, what would he do? What would he do? What would he be without? What would he do? Who is Louie? What would he want to do? Yeah. That resonated with me big time on this, on this rewatch. Just that, that longing to be seen, as who he truly is, even though he doesn't know, he almost wants someone to see it and tell him, you know, like he's like, oh, maybe Lestat will tell me who the fuck I am, you know, and that, oh, that just, and and, and that, that just horrible desperation to escape everything too. And that's, you know, how he ends up being turned is essentially wanting to leave everything behind. And, oh, I... I'm so excited to to watch the rest of the season and I'm so pumped about next season. I just, I'm really excited about our new Claudia. I think the casting for her is really great. She seems very different from, from Bailey Bass, but she also seems very confident and very sure of herself. And I think that that's perfect for the stage of life that we're, we're in with, with Louis and Claudia because Claudia definitely starts to take the lead a lot with Louis during this time period because Louis has, at least in the book, you know, I think that's something we have to like kind of look forward to is, you know, he has so much guilt about what they've done to Lestat and, and although he sets up everything for their, for their move to Europe, he's still like, Claudia takes a lot of the lead in a lot of what they do. So I'm very, I'm very excited to see what's next, you know. I am too. I am too. There's one line, one more line that I want to call attention to. Uh, it was one of my favorite lines from this, uh, from this episode when we watched it the first time. I want to call it out here again. Tom Anderson says the first time that we meet him, uh, Louis uh, says it's a great night. He's shaking the money tree, Mr. Anderson. And Tom says, can't see the dirt for the dollars fallen. It's just great original poetry. That's not from the book. Tom Anderson's not from the book, but it's a, it's a great no. line there. But I want to call attention to it here because of a later moment in the show. At the wedding, when the boys are doing their tap dance, that scene ends and transitions to the next scene by the crowd throwing the money onto the stage and covering the boys. And then you see a shot above of the boys laying on the, the, the dance floor and the money all over them. Right. And everywhere else Mm -hmm. can't see the dirt for the dollars fallen. I think there's poetry in that line that we missed the first time. This family is able to cover their holes because of the money that Louis is pulling in. When we meet him here in, in the 1910s, he's making money hand over fist in his nefarious dealings. The father is gone. The family was struggling personally in lots of ways, but he is patching their holes and shellacking over their problems with dollars. And Paul is the only one that's not seduced by it. Right. I think that that's um, that's just another piece of what we were talking about earlier, which is if Lestat had not come along, what would Louis' family be like? And I, that's one of the reasons why I think they would have been okay for a lot longer. They would have fallen apart eventually, but I think they would have been okay for a lot longer because they were so satisfied by by the the end result. I think that Mama Mama de Point du Lac felt like they are above this sort of business, but it's for the time being. Meanwhile, it's the business that's going to send my daughter and her new husband on a really nice honeymoon. Right. It's the business that keeps us in this beautiful house that we get to stay in. It's the business that allows us to throw this beautiful wedding party for our daughter. And even the church, you know, and so- even the church, they go to the church, he takes Paul to confession, and the priest comes and thanks him. The priest mm-hmm. never looks askance at Louis or what he's doing 
or the bodies that he is putting to work for him in all the different ways. You know, Louis Louis makes that confession later uh, at the end of this episode, but the priest isn't asking for it. The priest is happy to take the money and look in the other direction. Everybody is. And you're right, it would have lasted longer without Lestat, but... We see that story story uh, Storyville was going to fall apart anyway, right? The whites were going to eventually right. take that back and push Louis and all the other people of color out. The we we know what happens historically in the 20th century with race relations and that period right. of time <laughs> where people of color were allowed to sort of exist as second class citizens or or however you want to look at it in New Orleans that was eventually over and New Orleans went through yeah. the same sort of reconstruction and after that the rest of the South did so segregation I mean the segregation yeah. was right there I do think it's interesting that that the only reason Louis is allowed to move through this world in the way he is as a black man during this time period is because of the money and, and, and what he, what he's able to do with it. You know, like there's no, he was invited to that poker game before Lestat came along. You know what I mean? Like he knows these white men, he deals with these white men. And so it's like, it's a, it's, it's, it's almost like a veil of privilege that he's under until he's not. I, Lestat in his pitch at the end of the episode when they're in embracing their right at the very end he says I can take away that sorrow Louis swap this life of shame swap it out for a dark gift and a power you can't begin to imagine that's I think that's exactly what Lestat is talking about there Louis is yeah. living a life that is pretending to be one thing and inwardly is hollow and blackened and rotten and it's eating Louis and his family alive. And yet, you know. It pays the bills. Yeah. And there's no way out of it. Like, what? He doesn't what, see what other opportunities way. does he have? Yeah. You know, like, what other. Like, if there was another way to do this, I suspect he would be doing it. If he could figure out a way to not be a pimp, I suspect he would be doing it. Knowing our Louis the way that I feel like I know him. And I just, you know, like, to me, this is kind of one of those situations that's sort of a, a, it's, it's the, it's the, it's the, you, the cog fitting into the, into the perfect place in the clock. And that's the only spot you fit. And if anything changes, the clock's broken. So I feel like he's just feels like he's in a pressure cooker the whole time. And so this one chance for release, this one chance for escape with this one man, who seems to understand him more than anyone has before. Why would you not take it? I mean, I listen, Sam Reed, as I said, last episode could ask me to do just about anything. Uh, (laughs) But, but I do, but you do understand, you feel his desperation. You're there with Louie and you can see it from a third person point of view and say, these are bad choices you're making Louie. There's a different way to go here. Um, but you also understand why he makes the choices that he makes. And I do think the thesis of this series really is like, who is Louis? Who does Louis want to be mm-hmm. in the world? And, and how can he get there? We are continuing our rewatch. We'll be back with you next episode next week for episode two of season one after the phantoms of your former self. Uh, there's some really good stuff in this second episode that I recall already. I'm excited to get into it. Yes. And uh, Ashley, I'm excited to continue our discussion with you. I do want to call out here one more time because I know some of you don't listen to the book episodes. In our discussion of the vampire Armand, I made I ask a question: How are you going to have a character in Armand? whose story in the novels, at least anyway, is so wrapped up in the iconography of Catholicism and his ability to capture that iconography. Um, how are you going to tell any of that story with a character from the Muslim faith, from the Islamic faith, who yes. my understanding is does not have icons? So listeners, if you didn't listen to that episode, but you're hearing us now and you know something about this, I'd love to hear the feedback. Does the Islamic faith have iconography? Could you have, for instance, I don't know, port- Jesus, for instance, is a prophet, but not the prophet in the Islamic faith. Could you have portraits of Jesus in your house as a, a Muslim? I don't know. 
let me know how that's going to work. Or is it going to be, is the story maybe, and, and I'm thinking about this the wrong way, Ashley, is the story for Armand going to be that his faith tells him you don't make icons and yet his gift and his love of beauty and his masters at different times force him to, is that the deal? I don't know. Yeah. It's going to be really interesting. Armand, Unfolding Armand's backstory now is is more exciting to me than it was even, you know, even before when I was excited to read the vampire Armand for the first time. I think that um, it's so exciting and interesting to me to get an uh, to get a more in depth knowledge and understanding of of other people's faith, of other religions, of other cultural groups, things like that. Especially as someone who is not raised with organized religion, I find it so interesting and 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 exciting to learn about. And I think I, although I'm not religious, I do think faith is a really incredible thing and a beautiful, beautiful thing. So I'm really excited to see how, how we get to, uh, how we get to, how much we get to learn about Armand in the second season, or if that's going to be more of a season four or a season five thing, keeping our fingers crossed that we keep getting to move forward and get more stories of our, of our beautiful and fantastic and completely flawed vampires from your lips to amc's ears please daddy i'd like some more we would love some more please we've been very good and very patient absolutely we have all right until we talk to you again next time we have been your hosts i'm joel i'm ashley and we are the articulate couple Thanks for listening to The Articulate Coven. You can join our community on Facebook by following the links in the show notes or searching for Articulate Coven on Facebook. You can subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or at ArticulateCoven.com and share us with your Anne Rice-loving friends.